There we go. So we can move it as people come, but figure if we say group, then it's easier for them to see us away. Yeah. Good. And Team Ben is here. Just, just <laughs> so you can watch as he eats it. We're yeah. trying not to be rude about it. Um, <laughs> so for today, we wanted to revisit AI and ethics. Um, so we did AI and ethics about a year ago almost. It was probably like January. We did a conversation around mm -hmm. AI and ethics right after ChatGPT had come out. Um, and of course, we've covered a lot of ground since then. But we wanted to kind of revisit that topic this fall. Uh, we didn't really have a presenter or any code to show with that per se, but we thought it was important to talk about and bring back to the conversation of the group. And one of the ideas that we had for this conversation to help potentially focus it a little more is to think in terms of like, what could we create that would be helpful to students who are trying to think of through their ethical use of AI to really deepen their learning? So not thinking about using it too cheap because that's too easy to do. They don't have to have guidance on that. <laughs> um, but really, if you want to use AI to deepen your learning on a topic, whatever that topic might be, can we create something, even if it's just like a um, do this, don't do that type of checklist, it would be of help for students to think through, yeah. how can I use this and use it both ethically and to benefit my learning? Um, so that's what we wanted to throw out to the group. Um, I mean, obviously, JP and I have ideas around this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we also wanted to get input since we have students here, which is always helpful. Uh, like, What are the things you're thinking about? And what are the types of resources that you think might be helpful to you and your peers um, as you ponder these issues in your free time that you have so much of? So. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Um. I kind of want to let others speak first because I'm ha I'm not actively taking classes right now so I feel oh. like it's a little bit hard to gauge um in the same way yeah i don't know I'll so say... i think uh uh one thing because i did i i did use it for help with a a python class mm -hmm. um and i think one thing that jp brought up in the workshop uh and that we kind of worked through in the, the recent workshop was strategies for breaking down a coding problem instead of just yeah. mm -hmm. trying to automatically put the whole thing into chat gpt to get mm -hmm. the code answer um and so i thought that was a useful strategy that allows the student to still think through programming logic on their own but use chat gpt in a way that can enhance that learning or help uh, with a, completing a, an assignment. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It was like, I am finding it much more, I, I think my number one use of it, I have two number one, two uses of it, a productivity tool. I'll talk about what I mean by that, but also a sounding board, so to speak, like a thing that helps me think through what I'm actually trying to do. Because usually when I'm starting something kind of complicated, I don't actually really know where to start sometimes. Um, I'll spend hours just, especially in coding, just writing random things. Like, this is what I teach in my class, like not to do. I teach my students to 
ask the question, do you actually understand your problem? Like, what is it you're actually trying to solve? And try to come up with a plan of how are you going to solve it? And once you're confident, like, okay, I think I have a decent plan, then you start writing code. Your plan may not work. And you know, it may fail, and then you have to come up with a new plan. But at least you had a little bit of structure before you started just writing code and heading way down in some rabbit hole. Um, and so it's so useful for that to just be like, okay, before I start, let's just think of how I could do it. And yeah, that's something I can think of, but it's so good at that. It's so good at coming up with like five to 10 ways. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, that looks really promising. I'm going to go for that. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so sounding board for ways to think about approaching a problem. And as a productivity tool, I, I will say it's just like, accelerating the rate by which I can get content out. And a lot of that content is stuff that I'm not going to ever publish. It's like proposal writing. It's things that like two people are going to review and see if I get a proposal. I'm not really concerned about issues of plagiarism because I, again, I have no intent on publicizing it or publishing the, the work. Um, so like the example I just did yesterday was I, I needed to make a two minute video summarizing my pitch for a, a small award. And I took out my phone and spoke to my phone just to get speech to text because that's like faster than typing. So I just spit out a bunch of ideas. Like I want to talk about this, 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 these are the key ideas in my, in my pitch, but it has to be two minutes. And so I said, chat GBT, take my transcript of just random things that I put down in no particularly clear order and put it into a two minutes bit pitch. And it gave me something back that was like just about the right length and everything. Now it wasn't perfect. I did have to edit it and it used some really funky words. It said some like weird thing, like we're on the precipice of a revolution. I was like, I would never say precipice. So <laughs> I took that out. <laughs> but like, it was so fast to go from just thoughts to a script that I could then read. And that took the whole process, including recording the video was like 30 minutes. And that probably would have taken me like two or three hours if I had to sit and work through how do I want to put all these thoughts together. It just assembled it in a reasonable structure. Um, it mostly followed the structure that I already started with, but it was just from stream of consciousness to like a more polished version of that. That is a huge productivity gain. And this is where like we're talking about ethics, right? Like, is that okay? Like, I don't know. Um, I feel like that's on the board, that's on the side of yes, that's acceptable because I'm again, I'm not pitching. And you did it. And I and I already, <laughs> and I already did it. <laughs> and uh, if the funders watch this video, they'll know how I did it. But that's like a hack that um I feel like is a really good use of these tools. Um and maybe I was publicizing. What if it was for a two-minute radio bit that I'm gonna put on NPR? Is that does that change whether what I did is okay? I don't know. I feel like it's still mostly my thoughts. It was still my things that I wanted to say. It just helped me say them better. And just like I would if I had a professional coach or a professional editor who knows how to do radio really well would review my script beforehand anyway. And so a lot of what I would say on a radio show would have been edited anyway. So is it okay that a machine did the editing instead of a human? I don't know. I feel like it's kind of okay. Again, I've already done it. I'm justifying my my own my own crimes. Um, so one of, thing where is, where do you I kind of yeah. one thing I'd like to bring up or perhaps redirect the conversation because I think we have talked a lot about ChatGPT as a productivity tool, but yeah. you know, with this discussion about education, um, the examples that you gave JP are very kind of open-ended types of assignments and, and this idea of a, a creativity, you know, brainstorming thing. But yeah. if we can think in the context of students often get pretty structured assignments that mm -hmm. are asking questions um, of look up the meaning of this or, you know, sometimes checks to make sure that students do a reading um you know yeah. you two would know a lot more about structuring assignments but a lot of assignments are trying to get students to work through mm -hmm. things on their own and as a student who is perhaps trying to be most efficient then it is a simple question mm -hmm. that probably could be just answered by chat gpt um mm -hmm. and i think that's where we maybe get into some of these more challenging ethics questions 
of ChatGPT probably could do the whole assignment very easily. There's not a lot of like brainstorming or other input that a student could add. Um, so maybe that could be scope this discussion or some of the questions that we could get at. Yeah, and I think part of that is up to the instructor. I mean, if an instructor scaffolds an assignment where first you have to create an outline, then you have to create some draft pieces, and then you have to create like um, a mind map of how your ideas interconnect, they can start to deconstruct some of that to make it harder for just to use ChatGPT. But if an instructor just gives you an assignment and says, read this and write this, yeah, it's almost, I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's making it easy, but it's definitely making it possible for students mm -hmm. who consider cheating for one reason or another to go over that ethical boundary. And I don't think that students want to. I think that sometimes they're put in hard predicaments because of timing and yeah. it's instructors that aren't willing to bend around things going on in their life and they get pushed into it for the most part. I mean, I am aware that some people just cheat their way through all of life. And, <laughs> um, yeah. Eventually end up in positions of high power. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, I think people want to, but I'm not sure if they know how to yet. Like if I, we went over to the student center and pulled a random student, would they have any idea of how to use it to really improve their learning? And I think there's lots of good examples out there. Like last week we were talking to someone or I was, and they were saying how, I mean, well, maybe I'll just give the better example of, there's an AI program out of Stanford called Sherpa where you upload the article that you want students to read, students read it, and then the AI asks them questions to see, did they comprehend what they read? But you wouldn't have to have a tool to do that. I mean, you could, the student could upload what they're reading if it's an article. I and mean, if it's a book, it's a little harder. You'd have to scan it or something. But you could even just have it ask you questions like, I have a chemistry test next week. Give me 20 questions in this mm -hmm. part of chemistry. And I'm sure ChatGPT could come up with 20 questions to help you test your own knowledge that would help you study more effectively and check your understanding of concepts. And anyone could do that. Rather than putting in, write my paper, ask for, ask me questions to make sure I understood yeah, this content. So. Mike is here behind the camera now. <laughs> There's a voice. If you hear a voice in the room, you can slide up though. We're over here if you want. We're just kind of, cool. Today is just the discussion. The only one you won't know is probably Nicole, who's new. So you can say how to. <laughs> yeah, I think these are kind of ideas that, like, this thing is so new, we're at basically one year old now. Yeah. That means we've only had two semesters where students have had it really like okay, two two in total, sort of, um, to think about how to use it. And I don't know. I, I'm trying to imagine if I was a student right now, how would I be using it? Um, and certainly no one is telling me those ideas. Like I don't I don't think a single faculty, even us, <laughs> are in our classroom saying like, okay, for this assignment or this weekend, try asking it to give you 20 problems and see if you can solve them. And then if you can't, or you struggle, ask it for a solution and ask it to explain it to you. Like, brilliant use stuff. Great way to use it. And, and you'd probably gain more from that than an assignment I would write if, if you prompt it really well and give it you know a lot of good context to what you're trying to do. Um, but you have to like, so if we're leaving it up to the students to think that way, that's a very different way of thinking and, and not really what, the, incent the incentives are not aligned to do that. But I think people would would if you if they had ideas like that, if they were shown like here's here's ways to use it. Um I think many would. Um I think that's where the agents, the new GPTs yeah. will, because you could take that idea 
and you could have it as an agent where then students can use that agent to ask them questions out of your discipline. Yeah. You can have it read your book and yeah. say, I've assigned chapter 12, go to ChatGPT and it will just keep asking you questions to determine how well you understand chapter 12 <laughs> until you understand it well enough. And that's what the agent does is it keeps asking questions out of chapter 12 yeah. until you're getting them all right. That would be a useful agent to yeah. create for yourself. Yeah. Is it the new customized GPT function or something else? This is very new, is it like last week or just a few days ago, even? I think. Right? Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Monday or Tuesday, they yeah. announced yeah. in the new presentation. In well, I guess they call them assistants. Oh, it's, oh yeah, the assistant. Yeah. Okay. But it, they're setting up a store too where you'll be able to create them and then other people can buy yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which completely makes sense <laughs> that they do it. Um, yeah. But it's all no code. So you don't have to. Code. Or at least they say it's no code. Yeah. So I yeah. imagine you create that, an agent by just how you prompt it. And, imagine how and many how it. many new jobs can it can it create? And, well, and, prompt engineer was a job for a while, and that seems yeah. to be gone. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing very quickly. Yeah. Um. But uh, make your millions fast. I do feel like this is a. I mean, I feel like a few years from now, this will become like a standard part of education at a lot of places where there are lots of like. Like there's going to be like a learn to learn to code in Python agent or or a system that's not ChatGPT. It's like a full different system that is really optimized around that. And so your assignments won't be like solve these puzzles for me that I wrote myself. It will be like <clears throat> talk with the agent about chapter one, and the agent will just ask you a bunch of questions, and it'll start asking you to write puzzles. Or it'll ask you puzzles that you I as an instructor didn't even think about and everyone's going to have like a slightly different assignment. And I just look through your chat history. To, that's your assignment. You submit your chat history. And I'll go, okay, looks like you had a good conversation. Then I can quiz you on it. So I'm going to assume that you know what you've talked about with it. But having that, that's like, it's like having a personal educator, like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, and why would, why would we not want that? That, that seems like that would almost be definitely better than like, it's, it's like, the level of engagement with the content feels like it would be much higher if that's what you're doing, as opposed to like, here's 10 puzzles. I want you to solve these 10 puzzles and submit it. And everyone has the same puzzles. Um, that's set up in a way where like, everyone's just trying to get to the end goal. Like how quickly can I solve the 10 puzzles and submit it? So. I think of, I still think of one, one, like my, my experience, like when I was learning Python, but that was like three or four years ago. So the pre GPT era. So um that whole website is in like that whole tutorial is in forms of a conversation yeah. but it's all human made so every prompt from the teacher's side is fixed like mm -hmm. i will have the same information as, yeah. as you if, if you want to learn it as well and it's really like it's really all well prepared like every sentence that the teacher says is all well planned like you you the example you showed this morning like in the old times when people have the printout service, like they yeah. should all be the same. So that's the old version, like human made, fixed, static stuff. But right now with with the LLM, we can generate the reasonable pop, like re reasonable sentences from the GPT side, but it's randomized, like it's not fixed and it's yeah. really creative and it's really like, what is my, my poor, my poor vocabulary? <laughs> And it, I mean, it's good. Like it, it's it's really it's really oh, inclusive. Yeah. 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 It it it, it kind of forces you to think in, in totally different ways that we we couldn't come up with maybe uh, as instructors. Um, I think I'm less high on chat GPT. I think <laughs> it will always just be kind of like uh, clunky. <laughs> like there's probability involved, so. But uh, the way that I've been using it in the classroom is there's certain assignments where there'll be like a piece of the assignment and I'll be like, you could use ChatGPT for this. Yeah. Kind of like guiding them towards like, it's a totally fine acceptable use case, but also 
oh, this is the type of the thing I might use ChatGPT for, like not my whole assignment, but like this yeah. part yeah. where I'm asking them to like generate a, a fake data set or something like that yeah. to use in the assignment. It's good at it. Um, what Where else I think it's really good is, especially for undergraduates, is helping them plan their time for assignments. Because oh, okay. they're terrible at that in my experience. I mean, aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> it's like something is due at like the end. It's okay. So yeah. it's, it's not, it doesn't change. Yeah. I but I mean, like, here is your end assignment. Have ChatGPT help you create a schedule of what you're going to get done over the next three weeks to get it there. Mm. Like, and it's good at that type of stuff too. Like, it'll break it out and say, by the end of next week, you should have an outline and your outline mm -hmm. should have these. By the end of the week after, you should have this, this, and this done, yeah. and it can help them think through that. Whereas I can't do that as an individual for each student because they all have different schedules, and some are working, and some have family, and some are traveling. But they can put that into ChatGPT and say it's due in three weeks, but I'm going to be gone for these days. Create a schedule for me of how I'm going to get this assignment done. You know, give them something. I mean, they may change it and they may not follow it, <laughs> but it gets them to think in that manner, at least about it's not wait till the night before, because then they're more likely to cheat because they're under yeah. time pressure yeah. and they've done it to themselves in some ways. But if we didn't scaffold it for them, ChatGPT can scaffold it for yeah. them. Um, I personally don't know how valuable that kind of uh, um, interaction with ChatGPT would be, especially if we think like the people who would want to be planning in advance are probably already capable of doing that. Yeah. And, like the ones that aren't inclined to that, like may not even be asking for that kind of thing with ChatGPT. For me, like what is really helpful is um, using ChatGPT as the as your tutor. So yeah. like, hey, I don't want to understand this concept, this machine learning concept. Could you explain it to me? And you can even ask it to explain in like layman's terms. Yeah. yeah so it'll yeah. simplify. Yeah. And uh, so that's actually been helping me personally. And then actually as a TA, when I'm grading things, I'm like, is this a valid implementation <laughs> of uh, back propagation <laughs> of uh, implementing biases in the network? I'm not sure about this. Yes, yes. Uh, why or why not? Mm. So I'm kind of, it's helping me in the grading process at least a little bit too. But anyway, thanks for letting me share some ways that I'm using it. That's the productivity tool part, maybe. Grading uh, is sometimes just about getting it done and, and doing it correctly and fairly, but but it does take a lot of time. And so if things are, especially if things are repetitive and you're like, okay, these are similar responses. You could ask it, give me like five or six reasonable responses and just kind of compare. <laughs> uh, I could definitely see it as a really helpful tool for grading things. Um, so we, yeah, we've been talking about like, I, I don't know where the ethical boundaries of all these things end, you know, like, like the cheating case that I, I feel like there's very different varying levels of that. Like, the dumb cheating is always going to happen. I always call dumb cheating, dumb cheating. It's like the the fastest thing with zero thought to just copy paste. And whether it was coming from Chegg or like some other source somewhere, there's always going to be people who are just like, I don't care. I literally just want to get a grade and I don't care if it's like a C, I just move on and just cheat. And like our habitual <laughs> cheaters, I really don't know what to do about that. That's That's really not an AI problem. That's just the common problem in yeah. general. And now that you have this, this is yet another tool that they can use. So I'm not, I'm still really not concerned at all about the use of that in the class classroom. Because for, for one, it's typically quite obvious. Like the people who are doing that, I call it dumb cheating because they're not even reading what they're copying. Like they're copying things that are clearly just not even correct. And they just paste it in and you're like, really? You didn't even try to like make it look like you wrote this on your own? Um, and so it's very, it's detectable, but it's really obvious when, you, like, when you look at somebody's uh, um output, and you you can tell, well, it's completely copy and paste without any personal thought. Yeah, but so I'm, I and like, okay, that's gonna happen, but but I don't think that's happening for the most part. I think that's very much the like exception. And look, ChatGPT has been out there for a year. I don't, I haven't seen hardly any of that in my classes. I, I 
I started to see some answers starting with certainly with an exclamation. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> certainly. Like, oh, certainly. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and then when I see another one, certainly. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a regenerating in the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For coding without like pre large language model, I always encourage my students to be resourceful, cite. Yeah. Uh, site Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow and yeah. blog posts. So like I want them to be resourceful, but I want them to be transparent about it. Yeah. So I don't care if they found the answer online. I just want them to like put a comment that says, I found this here. Yeah. And at least they're like showing that they're yeah. they value academic, they value the transparency. Yeah. So for me, as long as I see that attribution, I'm personally okay with it. Yeah. And now, so translating that into large language models, like I'm okay if they use ChatGPT, but I want them to tell me I use ChatGPT for this question. And ideally, I would like them to show me what prompt they use. I haven't implemented that kind of guidance, but like, yeah. I want to see the prompts. And I heard you talking earlier about like maybe um, the ability to see which prompts the students use. Yeah. So almost at like the language model side, like if we could hook into that, have like this language models used for educational purposes, but your professor has access to which queries that you, <laughs> you gave it, that might give the professor some insight. I know there's always an alternative that they'll go use another model. Um, so we're kind of yeah. back in the same place, but I feel like personally, like attribution is fine, especially in this world where it's hard to control and prevent people from using that. But even if the tool is helping them, we want them to learn. So like, yeah. that's achieving the objective anyway. Oh yeah. Speaking of this, um, I want to I want to share my thoughts about the uh, a literature review. Like you, you yeah, you, the yeah. Is. And well, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm no, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I know. I, I, I'm trying to arrange my words. So uh, last, I think last week. JP has shared with me like one one um, one paper. It's called "Prevalence and Prevention of Large Language Model Use in Crowd Work," and right. that's a yeah. So that's a very like recent. That's a recent <clears throat> study. Like the crowd work means like something like prolific or uh mechanical curve, something like that. So so I think our survey will be a part of the uh, crowd work. So the findings are like. Within my expectation, like they started by creating a well-trained model, and that well-trained model can detect the, the like the response from from the users, so that uh, they find they found out that thirty percent of the users use um, which is ChatGPT to at least reinforce their their output. So. Um, and they even use some hurdles and requests to prevent them using it. And that effect was uh, obvious, like half of them, which is 15% of them stopped using it. But the thing is, it's nearly impossible to prevent people, like to 100% prevent people from using it. People will somehow copy and paste or take the idea of yeah. that GPT uh, to the response. And this part, is not recognized as cheating. So, like in in my in my summary of results, there is a line saying that, uh, LLM using is not equal to cheating. LLM LLM can assist can assist crowd workers, which I think will be, our like there will be a trend in the upcoming future. Like because since we're using LLM pretty much in every field like in on every purpose mm. so it will be impossible to avoid chat gpt but it's more like how people can better use chat gpt to reinforce their study their life their work their anything as long as you're you can balance between like how much your own work is and how much you get hint from chat gpt mm -hmm. and do you have your original thought like your base thought originated from you and even if you get hint from ChatGPT, you can think by yourself following that path. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you should have your own contribution and you should use your, the ChatGPT as a guidance. So I think that's the core um, ethical part. So like, but in my study, because because I, I'm, I'm working on the, uh, the like hundred survey of people's willingness of uh, taking part in smart charting of uh, PEVs, I don't think, is is a hundred percent 
detectable if people use use GPT or not. But as long as people use it in an ethical way, like they know what they're doing and they know when they get stuck, and um, ChatGPT will help in a certain degree, then I think it will be ethical. Like I think the yeah. challenge too is what you were pointing out is yeah. can we draw the lines for people to know when they move from ethical to unethical, unethical. in a clear way so that the student, the survey taker, whoever knows, I can use it for this, but I can't use it for this. Yeah. And I don't think we're doing that. I think, at least from what I've seen, it's a lot of vague statements. It's either like, you can use it, you can't use it, or, well, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's having so clearer lines for students to say, here's where you cross the line. I mean, it's the problem you have. Of, yeah. You, yeah. No one says where the line is for your yeah. use case. Yeah. But within a course, we can say where we want that line drawn. Yeah. yeah. If well, we think ahead course. about it. Yeah. yeah, the particular assignment, you can use it for steps one, two, and three, but you can't use it for four, five, and six. Then they know where they would be. Yeah. I guess, Nicole, you haven't had a chance to say anything. Yet. <laughs> we don't want to forget our online people. <laughs> No, that's fine. I'm actually out of school for a couple of months, so I, I really uh, can't have any insightful um, input for you guys about the students, what they will use. But I have a curious question of, um, so how would the professors change the way they teach classes right now? Would uh, have the chat GPT affected the way? professors teaching classes since you guys said students can use it as a tutor or like interactive educator so maybe maybe some professor will change the way they teach class instead of like um, going over content like more paper-based tests <laughs> that's what i <laughs> in the spring i mean yeah i mean <laughs> I if, if I want to assess, I mean, I teach coding. So if I want to assess your understanding of the language, just fundamental, do you know how this language works? Um, I'm doing paper tests and quizzes where you just write about pencil. But that wasn't because of ChatGPT. That's what I always did. Um, because it like you you really assess your your memory and your 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 understanding of it if you can write code with a pen. And pencil and paper. Um, this was what the, the only programming course I ever took uh, when I was a student. That's how they did everything. Um, I was in 2012 or 2013, and it was an intro to Python class. And you had to say, you know, write a function that does this, but write it using a pencil. So you really tested your ability to like think through a problem and make sure you understand the syntax. And um, I think that's a decent way to to learn that that kind of topic. But um, that's not really a change I'm making because of ChatGPT. I think the bigger changes is, is like the assignments and yeah, and like what you do outside of class and inside to some extent, I, I sometimes pull it up and demo it or demo how it sometimes doesn't give you the great response and how to do, you know, how to prompt it better and to get a better response. But a lot of my assignments, yeah, are, are sort of of the type where it's like, unless I told you, you should use it, then I, it's sort of don't use it. It's the, the guideline. So I will tell you specifically, not just where you can, but I'm like, this is you ha you have to. And like for this assignment, you have to for this part of the question, you have to ask ChatGPT these things, and then ask you know, uh, have a conversation with it, and then send me the link to your entire chat. Like I want, I want to see the whole conversation, not just the prompt. I want to see that you were engaged with it and you were talking with it, um, and. It's been kind of interesting to see the questions that people have. Like yeah. some of them are very, very thorough. Some of them go on for extremely long. Like it's just crazy long how far they've gone and like trying to ask it, like, why did this part of the function do that? Like I didn't understand that. Explain it to me. Um, and then you'll see that they try it and they say, okay, I just tried that. I got this error message. Like, what does that mean? That's perfect. Like that's actually what I want them to do. So if I'm telling them to do it, I feel like you're you're getting so much more engagement with that than if I had just said, you know, if we didn't have the LLM and I said, just write this function that does this one thing. Um, 
So, and you'll see, you're seeing varying degrees of that. Like some are really engaged, some are not. They're doing very minimal interaction with it. But at least I'm like asking them to interact with it. And so, so I'm having to be active about it and direct their use of it. Now, maybe they did that and then they also had another chat where they just said, okay, now write the code for me. <laughs> and they copied it in, I didn't see that. But at least I made them engage for a little bit. And so it's almost like I can assign them to do readings but then I don't know if they ever did the reading, you know, and I can ask them, write, write me a reflection on the reading, but that's not really a, a metric of whether they actually did it. But at least now I'm able to see a whole transcript of like, okay, you have to have typed that. You have to have read this for, for you to make sense. And I feel like that's a really good exercise. So I'm starting to put those in a lot of my homeworks or there are problems to solve, but there's also like forced conversations with the AI. <laughs> I am... I think that's a pretty good thing for the most part. Mm. All right, and maybe some of those are like, here's one example, simple problem. And I want you to have this conversation about how, and here's the solution, or here's one way to do it. I want you to have a conversation about why it works. And so I'm not, so I'm not even asking you to solve the problem. I'm, I, that's not the point of this. This question is about understanding why it works. Yeah. So talk with it, understand it. And when you feel like you've understood it, move on to the next problem. This one's similar, but now I want you to solve it. And, and that's about all I can do at, at beyond like, and, and again, I'm not really worried about cheating in that way because it's sort of cheat proof. Like you have to talk with it. But it's more like yeah. a guidance of properly use ChatGPT. Like so that so that when when people have to use ChatGPT in the future or they feel like they want to use ChatGPT in the future, future they will memorize it. They will start to remember, well, well, we I used to have a an assignment <laughs> that teaches me how to properly use ChatGPT something like that. I just feel like the more practice you have talking with it, the better you get about thinking of other ways to use it. Like definitely a year ago, I would not have done the, used it for the video assignment that I talked about earlier, where I talked into my phone and then I had it process that. Even though ChatGPT was already like here, I probably would not have thought to use it that way because I would have just written it out myself. But now that I've seen what it can do, I'm like, oh yeah, it's so perfect opportunity to use it to to quickly simplify this this text um and yeah, i try I, to stop I, myself whenever i'm typing something out yeah I'm and like, i try I really to think to type like, this do i yeah. have to type this or, or can, can I, I have it started and i just edit it yeah it's so like a lot of yeah letters of recommendation yeah. i mean for your phd student maybe but for other students it's boilerplate it's yeah like, it's mostly you're not you're trying to fill a page with saying things that, and then you can go in and add some, like, oh, they did this really yeah. well, but you have to just have filler. Yeah, 80% it's, of it is is kind of structure, and I can just yeah. use it for that. And so I'm using it in all kinds of ways like that. And, and I want my students to do that, actually. I don't want them to waste time doing things that aren't really require a lot of thought that are more routine. I, I want them to be focused on the high value add ideas where you're if you're having a conversation with it it's a learning opportunity yeah. um and otherwise use it for productivity to to move past things that are really like summarize your abstract for this conference that's coming up like okay well i already wrote the whole paper so just give me the abstract because I, I just need to get it into the conference and i don't need to spend a lot of time and you know that that's fine in my opinion it's fine like and you can go back to writing the role of the whole paper and <laughs> like finish fixing the paper or finishing the paper like the things where you need to spend your time but yeah those are all like anecdotes like so are there i don't think it's never going to be like a hard epic boundary and unless maybe we we come to some guidelines as a university or something i don't know like where's the yeah i mean you have it write the abstract can it write the introduction yeah can how far can it go <laughs> maybe I mean, but i'm saying it's kind of like what you were saying like as long as there's some initial idea by you, yeah. But I can justify a very small idea, and then that ChatGPT turn it into a whole big paper, yeah. And be like, oh, well, I wrote the initial prompt that was three words long, <laughs> so it's mine because I wrote the three words, and then it did all the other. Right. And is that ethical? It's like the question about art. Like, yeah. is, 
like is it art if it, if you're just prompting like are you the artist or like who's the artist and who owns the art like it reminds, that what you're saying reminds me of that conversation about using these tools for art yeah well and that's been a long conversation and like <clears throat> the yeah. grand masters they had people who painted most of it and then they would come in and they like, do a little touch up add a little shading put their initials on the bottom and it was worth millions <laughs> Was that ethical is a long <laughs> debate of and like, they like, didn't paint it from the beginning. They did a little shadowing and put their initials on it. Yeah, I mean, that's how a lot of senior faculty write papers. Not, I mean, yeah. <laughs> how many of them actually wrote most of that paper? Um, they put their name on the end and say, okay, well. That's so good at the beginning. Sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the really unethical ones just put their name at the beginning. Yeah. It was their idea. And that, I had a professor who was that's, like that. Yeah. He's like, I'm yeah. always the lead author because the initial idea was mine. And you're just writing it from a different angle, but that initial nugget was yeah. mine. And uh, Until you get yeah, called hundreds. out for fraud, and then you're like, oh, I don't know who the RA was. I don't know. When, yeah. Like, that one in the... And when at Duke. But it's yeah. Very yeah. Like, more like when you have a good, good initial idea, as long as you keep engaging with the idea, then, I, I mean, like the percentage of the engagement will be um well, yeah. like for example i would i would say using chat GPT is more like driving a car like for example if i want to drive uh drive from here to another place then um did the car get there well yeah the, the car gets there but without me the car won't get there but only by myself i won't get there as well well i can get there <laughs> but i can just on foot i, I can walk there for like one hour or two but the thing is with the car i'm inside the car i'm controlling the car even the, the thing is, like, there's one mechanical trick, like, when you are, what is the, what is the, the wheel? Name? Steering wheel. Yes. Steering when, wheel. Yes, yeah, so when you are controlling the steering wheel, you, it seems like you are giving a force to it. No, you are giving the signal of the force, and the, the, uh, the motor inside it will give larger force. So, yeah. actually, you're not even turning the uh, steering wheel. Yeah, power and, steering. Yeah. yeah, so the power is inside. So I'm only giving the direction, giving the signal to the wheel and to the to the paddle, like two paddles. So I'm giving direction, I'm giving instructions to the car, and the car gets there. So I think it's more like our our relationship with ChatGPT. Like I am trying to fine tune the prompts that I gave to ChatGPT, and it gives me feedback. Then I can refine the feedback. I can polish the feedback over and over again as long as i can like in the end i can get like a perfect feedback and is that feedback from me or from chat GPT, GPT? well i think well that's from both but as long as i can get enough sufficient engagement with it i can be confident to say that well i have well that's my work something like that that's that's my work so as although the the boundary is vague and as long as people are confident about the engagement then I think that's a proper way to use it. But then explain that to an 18-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> first year at college, 18 years old, sitting in their first... Like, it's like driving. They're like, I don't have a license. <laughs> <laughs> I've only taken Uber my whole life. I don't know what driving is about. Um, oh, that makes me think I don't metric of, think... Uh, yeah, go for it. Like. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I think that trying to standards, broad standards, and, and this has already been expressed, but I think that trying to set broad standards doesn't work, that it is very context dependent, and that I think it really, in the case of, you know, an undergraduate course or any course, it is on the instructor to detail that um, and to be thoughtful about what they want a student to get out of every assignment. Is this to have them practice ideas? Is this to help them learn? You know, whatever the objective is, then the instructor should craft that assignment in a way that you all said makes the student develop that skill um, and sets those expectations. And that is the contract as part of a syllabus um, and, and enrolling in that course. So, um, I think that would be my take. And then the ethical guidelines are stated um, as, as part of that. And yeah, then, also, yeah, in terms, yeah. 
and it's just good course design. Like a lot of people don't do just that, even without the AI parts. Like, just tell me why this assignment is useful and what I'm supposed to get out of it. It's like the concept of a transparent assignment design is like a, a thing. And most of my assignments say purpose at the top. It's like, this is why I'm making you do this. I think this is, a, this is what I want you to gain out of this. And like a lot of people don't do that even. And you're just like solve these problems. Like, but why? <laughs> You should give them a why they're doing this stuff. Anyway, you were saying. I was thinking of a possible <laughs> metric based on what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Of what percent of your prompt was generated by you? And that if it's a high percentage of you generating the prompts, then maybe it is your work or your art or whatever. Yeah. But in the case of like an assignment where you say, here's the prompt, give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, the, the purpose there is different. It's yeah. Like yeah. Learning, but. Yeah. I don't know. I just yeah. Because mm -hmm. in that you're not trying to gauge their yeah, right. contribution of knowledge no. to that. It's just a just a different way to, to ask them to mm -hmm. uh, asking them to engage with some topic for a little while with something else. It's not someone else, but something else. It's like write a letter. And right. also in the realm of publishing, mm -hmm. it is more common now to have a credit author statement and where you have to say exactly what each author on the paper contributed, whether it was data collection, initial writing, editing. So that that's even, you know, pre chat GPT, where there is, they're trying to encourage more transparency about what different authors are contributing to a piece and incorporating in referencing chat GPT or any other language model, I think makes sense. Um, and then you can you debate about whether or not having that statement is actually achieving this goal of giving credit where credit's due. I think that could be debated, but that is the standard that within yeah. the academic community, we are agreeing to accept Yeah. at present. I, I think it is still exceedingly hard to get the system to do like a lot of the, the writing like i mean we're, most of our papers are like we did this whole complex analysis that took months <laughs> and the writing of it is just me attempting to communicate to others like what we did and so it's very hard for me to like even like writing a method section what was the method you used well i know exactly what i did because i've done it but by the time I have written down the steps that I want ChatGPT to explain, like I basically wrote it. And there's a diminishing returns to how good it's going to do on that. Like it, I find it to be much better as like a, like an editor who takes this horrible paragraph I just wrote because I wrote it quickly and I just had to get the thought down and have it revise that. And I'm like, that's great because now more people will understand the science you did. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's like almost unethical to publish really obtuse things that only three people can understand. Like if the more people that can understand it, that's actually better for the world. So I'm kind of okay if it wrote the entire introduction because you weren't, if, if you weren't able to do that on your own, like to me, that's not necessarily the authorship of the study. It's the six months of work you did collecting all the data and doing the analysis and the work like that's that's what that is your true authorship that's the ownership of the work um it's just writing that up and that's that's sort of a research paper though that's a different purpose than like i don't know writing a opinion piece for the new york times or something then maybe we can get into a grayer area of like did it write most of the opinion piece for me um but I'm, and especially for the non-English native speakers, like the scientific world mostly publishes in English. And if that's not your native language, uh, this is gonna be a really hard task for you. Like I cannot imagine trying to write my papers in Chinese, like the, the immense difficulty that would be. But if like the world was just slightly different and all academic papers had to be in Mandarin, good luck <laughs> uh like that's insanely hard for me and i would definitely i would i would 100 have to rely on on the ai to do 95 percent of that i would barely be capable of editing it so it's it's completely unreasonable to me to be like well i'm sorry a chinese student you have to write this in english for this journal 
and it has to be written with the expectation that it has not just good English, but like ex ex exquisitely good English that's like grammatically perfect and compelling and motivating and like boy, that's really hard to do. I, I'm, you know, this person's a scientist. They, they spend all their time doing this thing in the lab. They're not a professional writer. So why not have a professional writer help them? And to the extent that when I review papers, I regularly see the other reviewers make these comments about how like, Bill, the, the language use wasn't really clear. Um, consider hiring a professional editor to, you know, revise your next vision. And like, they say that all the time. It's, it's like very consistently, I see that when there is rather poor English and that suggestion is like, okay, so I guess you're just expecting me to pull out 500 bucks somewhere and pay for this so I can get this published. Like, that's kind of ridiculous. Now we have a low cost way to do it, okay, if not free way to do that. That work is, I feel like 100% on the side of ethically okay. If it even if it's writing whole introductions for you because you've still done the science mm -hmm. and that's, you're just trying to communicate as in. That's a, that's a whole different, purpose so I'm I'm like yeah the, some of the journals are upset about that and they want you to say like if it wrote a lot for you and I'm like that's cool I don't care it reads really good good job <laughs> like, it's clear I can understand the experiment you did this experiment's the part I care about you know yeah I'm thinking of I might also use chat GPT to refine my English after I after I finish my draft I do. I mean, yeah, I, I have yeah. it look at everything I write. Uh, most things I write, I have it kind of think about anything it. important. I, really? have, I look at it, especially for it's just not that short email to JP, but yeah. anything, an email to my dean, I have that help write because I want it yeah. to sound. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't thought of that before today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I use it. Yeah, for that, you know, anything that's important or sensitive, I will often have it just check that it's okay. correct even like that I didn't say something wrong like it's it's a great and it does pick editor. up like you didn't use a not when you meant to oh, okay like sometimes I'm writing along and I'm thinking about other things I had and a, you can forget a not and it changes the whole meaning yeah I had a horrible one good at picking that yeah. type of stuff up or um I probably skip a verb I skip verbs a lot I guess because like, again, I'm just thinking, trying to get stuff out. Um, yeah, I I had a very embarrassing one where I no. was writing an author of, a, I thought, a great paper, and I I wanted to collaborate with them on something, and I was a student, so I wrote them this, trying to be a compliment, this pre pre chat TPT, so I didn't have these editing tools. And, I, and somewhere at the end, I said something like, I was like, anyway, uh, I thought this was not a really great study anyway, so whatever. It was something like that, some like nonchalant thing, trying to be kind of soft. And I didn't catch that I had to put not in there or something like that. And so I, it sounded like I was like, anyway, your work kind of sucks. So, <laughs> and they were so confused because they were like, you just said you like it. But then at the end, you were like, this isn't a very interesting paper. And I was like, wait a minute, no, no, no. So I immediately had to reply and was like, I'm so sorry. That was a typo. I meant to say it was really great. Sorry. And like, I, I caught it, but like, <laughs> wow yeah. like that would have been read very very differently if i had and so simple i know that feeling simple, i did that before but like one word differences and yeah have it edit things for you that I are see. and ask it like here's the paragraph say like summarize this for me and then you read the summary and go is that, is that what i wanted to say <laughs> um you know so i'm i'm using it pretty often uh, most small little things no but like uh, yeah an abstract to something a an introductory paragraph that I'm kind of like sitting on for a while because I'm not happy with the way it's written. I might work with it through through ChatGPT, but it's it's a constantly back and forth. It's never like copy. It works great. It's constant editing of it. Yeah. Well, and then it works the opposite too of having it explain things. Yeah. Like I've talked about this, and my in laws were moving, and we were going over legal documents with them. And I can't read legalese. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of words. Yeah. And it's so confusing how lawyers write. And it explains it. I, mean, I don't know if it's perfect explanations, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. At least. Ah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I do it sometimes. Like when I when I read like very hard English literature to me, then I just uh, feed it to ChatGPT and say, like, explain it to me. What's yeah. in, in bullet points? Yeah. What are they saying? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my computer. Oh, it's all good. Um, so I'm wondering, like, to what extent it will become like confidential? Like, you cannot use it at all to ask 
something that's like for example, um, Professor Ryan was talking about the legal stuff. Like, to what extent you you should not put something into the chat GPT that it's really confidential? There's been like congressional bills written in with chat GPT, <laughs> I think, or at least one that I know of. But there are a lot of companies that don't allow it too because anything you put in may be used in some way by open AI. They're very vague on what they're doing with the data. Yeah. So if you have like, if you're working on a patent proposal, I wouldn't go putting your patent proposal into chat GPT. Now in theory, if it just feeds into the model, no harm really comes of it, but it could. I mean, as JP has mm. said, he's found references to code that he has written because he knows it's in his package and no one else has ever written that code and it scraped it right off of github yeah so in the outliers there is risk in the mainstream there's not much risk but if i was working on a patent application i wouldn't ask chat gbt to help with it because yeah. again out of that fear you don't know where that data is going yeah and I know like news organizations aren't using it because their reading of all of the fine print is that ChatGPT, OpenAI owns the content, they're afraid. So if they have it right, newspaper articles or something, they're not confident that they have ownership of that material anymore due to the way the legal phrasing on ChatGPT's website is. Yeah. So for the time being, they're not allowing it used like or AP or Reuters or any of those big news organizations over ownership issues, not over quality issues, but very legal ownership issues of, yeah. They don't want open AI to suddenly come back and be like, we own all of this because you put it in, <laughs> which is less our concern, but it is many people's concern. Um, and then on the other side, there's a, question about who, who owns the content that OpenAI use, like are, is OpenAI even um, authorized to use all the content that I did? Probably not, but yeah. yeah. And that will get sorted out in the courts in a decade. Yeah. And they, I, have enough they have enough money to hire enough lawyers that it'll be in the courts until they've changed their complete business model <laughs> and gone on to something. I'm, I'm looking forward to those court hearings, you know, because like, or at least, like the congressional hearings where you have someone like Mark Zuckerberg come in and you hear the questions they're asking and go like, they have no idea how the internet works. So like, <laughs> you're like, oh my God, like it's, um, or like the one for TikTok was 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 pretty bad. Um, like how the questions are just, they have, they have no concept. And so you're like, okay, this is, it's like, you're not in the right league here to understand what's going on. The, um, the tech is getting so far ahead of the policy that, yeah. It's it's way past it now. But the other concern I read about the other day too is the tech is so far ahead of the research at universities. Yeah, that we're pretty much out of the game in terms of being able to oh, yeah. keep up with what they're doing because they just have so much more compute power than we do. Yeah, like they're building things that we could never even have our students think about building because we don't have access to that level okay, of power. $50 million to train a model. And, and then under new legal guidelines, it's in question whether will you even be able to access it. And yeah. kind of the interesting thing is like a lot of the legal frameworks that they're talking about, like in the EU and stuff, would pretty much mean only the big companies can actually do any of this going forward because they're the only ones who could afford all the lawyers and auditors and everything to be able to make sure their models are yeah. safe to do the compliance. So it's in their favor to actually support this because they're the only ones who will be able to actually make new models <laughs> and stay within the regulations because universities won't be able to do it. You we don't can have barely register resources. students for the spring semester. I mean, we can barely. <laughs> I mean, we are we going to regulate? <laughs> Well beyond our capabilities. Yeah. <laughs> okay. but it's an interesting dilemma. So well, we're at past the hour now. Um interesting conversation. 
Well, we'll be back together in two weeks and we have a guest speaker from the University of Maine who did her dissertation using NLP methods, mm -hmm. looking to see um, how public conversations related to some political decisions that were being made over fisheries and stuff, if I understand it correctly. Um, and then we have one more after that for the semester. And I can't remember what, I think it's on GitHub. You're oh, doing GitHub Actions or something? GitHub Actions. Okay. So how to run cron jobs and stuff on GitHub, yeah. which is just very useful for simple repetitive tasks. And sometimes very frustrating. Um, okay. okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you. Bye.